Our help is in the name of the Lord. We come together as the church to offer praise and thanksgiving to God, to hear the holy word, and to seek for ourselves and others the power, presence, and direction of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Eternal God, by Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, you gave to your apostles many excellent gifts. Give your grace to all servants of your church that me may with diligence and faithfulness fulfill our various ministries. Grant that we, your people, may follow where you lead, perfect our ministries, and live in joyful obedience to your will through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.
We are so glad this afternoon to, to welcome you here uh, to this worship and to make a few introductions because some things have changed since our program was printed. As you may have noticed by now, Bishop Justman is not able to be with us today and we will miss his ecumenical witness. But it is with great joy that we welcome our worship today Bishops Sharon Rader and Linda Lee. For those new to our annual conference, Bishop Lee has retired from active service as resident bishop in September 2012 after four years of service in the Michigan area and eight years in Wisconsin. And while she is retired as a resident bishop, she continues to be in active service to the church as the bishop in residence at Garrett Evangelical Seminary and interim executive secretary for the General Commission on Religion and Race. She and her husband, Lamar Gibson, live in Cottage Grove, Wisconsin. Thank you, Bishop Lee, for being here today to help us celebrate. Our preacher for today is also someone well known to many of us in Wisconsin. Bishop Rader retired in 2004 after serving 12 years as the Episcopal leader of the Wisconsin area. She and her husband Blaine live in Chicago. She has also served as bishop in residence at Garrett Evangelical Seminary and was honored this year with an honorary doctorate in recognition of her outstanding service to the church and the seminary. And she has served as secretary of the Council of Bishops and ecumenical officer for the United Methodist Church. It is joy to welcome her to become to us to bring the word of God today. And we also are very pleased to have with us Bishop Chul Lee, who is now the active bishop leading the Dongbu Annual Conference. At the same time in Korea that you are a bishop, you also are the lead pastor of a congregation. And at this time, he is also the pastor of King Young Central Methodist Church. We are also very glad that Ray Buckley, who many of the annual conference will know as our Bible study leader, has agreed to continue to be with us as long as he can before he has to leave us to return to Alaska. And we're very glad that he is uh, here on the platform and is going to be participating in worship with us. Greetings and blessings. Let us join now in the recognition of our common ministry and reaffirmation of our baptism. Ministry is the work of God done by the people of God. Through baptism, all Christians are made part of the priesthood of all believers, the church, Christ's body made visible in the world. We all share in Christ's ministry of love and service for the redemption of the human family and the whole of creation. Therefore, in celebration of our common ministry, I call upon all God's people gathered here, remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. In the Revised Standard Version of the uh, Holy Scriptures, which I was given when I was uh, consecrated a bishop in the United Methodist Church, NRSV wasn't out yet. That's how long I've been around, friends. <clears throat> Um, the introduction to the book of Galatians says this about this little book. Often called the Magna Carta of Christian liberty, the letter to the Galatians deals with the question whether Gentiles must become Jews before they can become Christians. Paul insists, on the contrary, that a person becomes right with God only by faith in Christ and not by performance of good works, ritual observances, and the like. With that introduction, <clears throat> hear these words of scripture from the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians. I'm not going to omit the verses that the, the uh, bulletin says I will omit. You were called 
to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slave to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite, <clears throat> and don't turn two pages, and devour one another, and take care that you, do not, uh, that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit, and what the spirit desi desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like that. I'm warning you as I warned you before those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of these holy scriptures. Amen. I said it last night. I thought it as I crawled into bed. I thought it as I woke up this morning. I'm still thinking it. It's good to be back with you. Thank you, Wisconsin Conference, for this invitation. Thank you, my friend and colleague, Bishop Hisu. Thank you, Cindy Sharan and Steve Polster, who did all the things they were supposed to do to make it possible for us to be here. Thank you, Wisconsin Conference. There is a sense in which I've never really had an opportunity since I left you to say, it was good to be here with you for 12 years, receiving and teaching. <laughs> It was good to be here receiving and teaching, doing it, receiving your pastoral care, and all of that you did for a neophyte bishop who really didn't know where things were or how to do things, or who, as one DS politely informed me after a couple cabinet meetings, you know, Sharon, you are very different, and we've been trained differently than the way you're doing things. <laughs> And so we went on a journey together. We learned from one another. We made mistakes for sure, and we forgave one another. We risked and we grew together. And on this day, I wanna say thank you. Now will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O oh God. You are our redeemer and our strength. Amen. You've been told that we live in downtown Chicago most of the year. Some of you who remember will know that we used to love to go to Michigan. We still do. We haven't had much time to do that yet this summer, but we're going to get there this next week. I read the Chicago Tribune most days, and on a recent day, there was this interesting article 
about a woman named Linda Nessie who was on her way to run errands only to find that there was a 250 pound alligator lolling on the back blacktop outside her garage in south suburban Chicago. <laughs> I'm going out, she said, peering out the garage door at her husband Jim and then glancing at the alligator which had just spread its jaws wide enough to swallow a soccer ball. Jim and Linda Nessie weren't much impressed by the alligator, actually, because it's a family pet and local celebrity that they call Bubba. She merely was worried about backing over his, her tail with, his, with her SUV. An alligator in the driveway is cause for alarm, particularly in some southern states where gators are something of a nuisance to sunbelt suburbanites, but not so in the Nessie's subdivision of wide lawns and expansive homes. Even the UPS lady loves him, Jim Nessie said to the reporter. She walks right in and says, hello, Bubba, and walks right over him. <laughs> Nessie is just one of two legally licensed uh, uh, alligators <clears throat> in the state of Illinois. The other one is in the Nessie's basement, along with a pair of monitor lizards the size of beagles, a crocodile large enough to eat a beagle, and Blondie, which is an albino Burmese python long enough to coil around a small car. Some alligators, said the article, can grow to 14 feet and be quite ferocious. But Nessie's seems to have become quite domesticated and tamed end quote of article. I'm always reading the paper so I can find a sermon illustration. You just got it. <laughs> but I read that story, and the next Sunday, Blaine and I were in church up at our little summer place in Michigan, and there was the illustration by the pastor where Blaine and I worship um, about an occurrence in his life. And there seemed to be a convergence of these two stories, and so I'm going to tell you the story that the pastor told as well. He talked about one of his earliest member, uh, memories uh, as a child were of trips that he took with his parents to downtown Flint, Michigan, Linda. <laughs> one of the stops was always the SS Kresge, Kresge, Kresge store on Saginaw Street in Flint. Now this story probably only connects with people who are over 50 since anyone younger than that has little chance to experience those stores. <laughs> Suffice it to say, Kresge's was the forerunner of today's Kmart. And back in the 50s and 60s, the five and dime market was invented and then dominated by two entrepreneurial giants, Woolworths and Kresge's. Like the giants, Walmart and Kmart today, both these marketing geniuses broke ground for the megastores that have now asphalted forests and farmlands. The ideas that both Woolworths and Kresge's sold was that you could get virtually anything and get it cheap at their stores. It did seem that they stocked everything, from dishes to dresses to tools and toys. They even stocked um, suitcases, which as a fifth grader, I was allowed my first time to go sh Christmas shopping by myself, and I went to Kresge's in downtown Battle Creek, Michigan, and bought a suitcase for my mother. From the Kresge's, you know how high quality it was. <laughs> you could get all of these things, and plus a hundred different colors of thread, and a hundred types of candy to cosmetics, and yes, at the Kre Kresge's, you could buy a Crocodile. This is coming together, just stick with me. <laughs> yes, crocodiles. Small crocodiles they were. The pastor said, I distinctly remember seeing an aquarium in the back of the Kresge store with an aquarium filled with tiny crocs. But along with the seemingly endless supply of those remarkably short lived baby turtles and an Easter baby chicks, crocodiles were a very popular item among kids who longed for a pet who only had 75 cents and who lived in a very small house or apartment. For just those few coins, you could purchase a six inch long wonder, a big nosed, a uh, long nosed, big eyed, whip tailed, thankfully, still small toothed crocodile. Now said the pastor, 
Research shows that crocodiles are strange, primitive-looking creatures that possess a host of unusual characteristics. Perhaps one of their most fascinating features is that crocs continue to grow in length, in girth, in weight, throughout the course of their lives. There is no maximum size for crocodiles to reach. They simply increase at an optimum rate of about one foot per year. In the wild, the toll of available prey, predators, old age, and disease makes it unusual for any individual croc to make it past 15 or 20 feet, that is, in 15 or 20 years. But given perfect conditions and health, it's possible a crocodile could grow as large as 30 or 40 feet in length. Indeed, that's the point. There's no proven upper size limit for the creatures. So how could Kresge's sell a kid a crocodile that would grow up to take over the whole house and eat everyone in it? <laughs> Every crocodile was sold in a box, and the box was part of the deal. There was a warning that went with the croc in the box. Never leave a crocodile outside the box. Never, ever. If kept inside the box, the crocodile would never grow any bigger than the box in which it lived. Even though there was nothing genetic to keep the baby dime store crocs from growing to enormous sizes, as long as they remained inside their boxes, tamed, as long as they were never exposed to greater space or freedom, they would stay the same small, kid-friendly size. The human mind and soul, <clears throat> indeed the congregations from which we all come, are rather like those crocodiles. Given unlimited food, a nurturing environment, a safe place to develop, growth is amazing. We've been given the capacity to grow without predetermined limits. We can grow and we can learn and we can change. Yes, we can, unless we allow ourselves to be tamed, like the alligator in the driveway or the crocodile stuffed in a box. And there are all kinds of boxes into which we might be contained. Boxes of callousness, envy, hatred, bigotry, a box of ignorance, a box of preconceptions, a box of fear, a box of apathy, a box of despair, a box of pride, a box of self-righteousness. Sometimes the boxes are imposed upon us by well-meaning but not helpful others who believe there is only one way to do things, one way to believe, one way to understand. But most of the time, the taming and the boxes are self-made. We build them about ourselves thinking that we're protecting some precious idea or some conviction. The truth is we're simply too frightened or too lazy or too angry or to deal with the new information or the new situation, the new possibilities that the spirit is sending us, whether it be in our personal lives, in our congregations, or in our communities. In the lesson you heard me read from the book of Galatians, we hear Paul writing to this church that he had established, and it's one of the earliest writings we have from the New Testament. 
in Paul's absence from the church as he had gone on to further missionary work, and as the people that he left behind in Galatia sought to do what was right, they began to establish some rules for guiding the new converts and the new community's life. Though many of the new leaders were themselves Christian, they were also Jews, and it was hard to let loose of some of what they had known before, the ways that they had been taught to honor God. There was a way of being religious that they believed needed to be adhered to, and so boxes were built. Rules were established. Circumcision and Mosaic law observance became conditional grounds for covenantal membership. Gentiles needed to become Jews in order to be reconciled to God. Paul had given oversight to those people in Galatia. He had established the church preaching a gospel of grace. He taught them that everyone was included in God's covenant people, a reality made known in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ who gave himself for them. Once they had become captive to forces that held them down, once they had been kept captive to forces that held them down, Paul taught them Christ brought the world to an end and established something new. Markers that once separated Jews from Gentiles were invalidated, or speaking more precisely, were annihilated. God's purpose had been made plain. God creates and wants new people who are one in Christ Jesus, bound together in faith and love. And the Holy Spirit would keep them that way in that new reality, that new hope. As God's children, each one, and indeed the whole community would be transformed, not just for their own personal benefit, but to produce fruit pleasing to God. The Spirit's transformative power, Paul said to those in Galatia, resulted in the breaking down of the boxes into which people and communities had been placed. There was no longer any division between people between the gospel and ethics, the whole community's life was reshaped through God's redemptive work in Jesus Christ. For Paul, the boxes that were now being recommended were a denial of the very gospel he had taught to the churches. And Paul would have none of it. And so, We have here a very early form of Christians disagreeing with one another, only happened then, doesn't happen now, about how best to give, that wasn't in my script, but it just came to me at that moment. So we have here a very early form of Christians disagreeing with another about how best to give expression to the love of God in their lives. The communities of faith that Paul had established had heard from him the good news of God's transforming inclusive power. They had been filled with joy, had been baptized and changed from who and what they were into a newness of life and living. Listen, Paul says to them, listen those who recognize the saving work of God in Christ and live in the power of the spirit experience freedom. You are no longer constrained, enslaved, or separated from one another. Stand firm, he admonished them in the freedom that was won for you. Stand firm in Christ. Stand firm in your freedom. Ah, freedom. There are those outside the church and outside Christianity who seem to think we're not about freedom at all that what we really about are laws and do's and don'ts and operating in particular and rigid ways. Freedom, they say, that's not what many in our culture view this life to which you who are to be licensed, commissioned, and ordained are entering, not the life of freedom, they say. It's not the lifestyle the unchurched in the villages and towns and cities in which your congregations are located see you. Freedom, 
Truth be told, there are even many leaders and congregations within United Methodism, let alone Christendom, who live and act as if we had not been set free from the boxes that have constrained us. But I declare to you this day, my friends, you are, we are, this church of ours has been set free to live, to love, to dance. We almost tried it a little bit last night. And to invite others to do the same. Kathy Matea recorded a country western song some years back that has some lines that I've used over and over again. I hope you didn't hear me use this once upon a time in Alaska. I got three sermons out of this refrain uh, when I was preaching up in Alaska one time. The lyrics go like this. My daddy told me when I was a young girl a lesson he learned. It was a long time ago. If you want to have someone to hold on to, you're going to have to learn to let go. You got to sing like you don't need the money. You got to love like you won't get hurt. You got to dance like nobody's watching. It's got to come from the heart if you want it to work. Now, there is one thing I keep forgetting when everything is falling apart. In life as in love, you know, I need to remember there's such a thing as trying too hard. You got to sing like you don't need the money. You got to love like you'll never get hurt. You gotta dance like nobody's watching. Whether you're thinking in these moments about your own personal life, or you're thinking about the life of your congregation back home, what would it mean for you, for your congregation, for this conference, yes, even for the United Methodist Church, to break out of the boxes into which we put ourselves, or the boxes into which others try to put us? What would it mean to begin singing like we don't need the money, loving like we won't get hurt, and dancing like nobody's watching. I'd like to charge us this day to at least sometimes sing like we don't need the money. You see, I do truly believe that we are gathered here this day because we really do know that the Spirit of God has placed a message deep into our hearts that has made all the difference in the way we view the world and all the people in it. And because of that change in us, we can't just sit around and hope someone notices. We've got to sing. We've got to get the message out. We've got to let others know that God sent Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit into this world to let us know that no one needs to be bound by boxes of rules and laws and old patterns and ways of doing things. There was a little song I used to sing with the kids in the children's choir I directed that went, God loves me the way I am, I turned out just right, but I'll sing it again in case I forget. And strange as it seems, I might. We don't have to be timid about sharing that God's love can make a difference, that people and congregations and communities can change. We can sing a summons to this hurting, despairing, warring, screwed up, and fear-filled world that building lives and Christian communities shaped and guided by the Spirit will produce the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. John Peterson, in rendering this passage of scripture, put it this way, God brings gifts into our lives, things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity, we develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Oh, don't you think this world needs to hear that kind of message? We've got to sing it. Sing it. Sing it. Let people know that they do not need to be afraid of other people, of ideas, 
ideas of systems that are not like the ones they're used to encountering. Sing, sing, my friends, sing like you don't need the money. Were you as moved as I was on Good Friday this year to read the news reports of the newly elected Pope Francis, spending his time on Maundy Thursday down on his knees, washing the feet of people popes don't usually associate with. Homeless people, women, prisoners, Muslims, people whose feet weren't particularly pretty. There were some who didn't much like those actions of the Pope. He, after all, didn't wear all the proper clerical attire. He didn't do the foot washing in one of the grandest of cathedrals. And who knows what he said quietly to those with whom he ministered. But my friends in Christ, we have been set free to love like we'll never get hurt. A free week, few weeks after Easter, Pope Francis was gathered with just a small congregation of about 200,000 people who were gathered in St. Peter's Square in Rome, and they had a question and answer time. I don't get it. But anyway, <laughs> one of the things he said in response to a question was, we cannot become starched Christians, too polite people who speak of theology calmly over tea. We have to become courageous. Now, I've marveled at Francis's straight talk and his simplicity, including his admitting, this one I really loved, to that 200,000 people crowd, that he sometimes nods off while he's praying at the end of a long day. That's kind of, you know, simplicity I like. But even more importantly, he told them, he said, it breaks my heart that the death of a homeless person is not considered news. If we step outside of ourselves, we'll find poverty, he said, repeating his call to do more, to seek out those on the fringes of society who need help the most. Today, and it breaks my heart to say it, he said, finding a homeless person who has died of cold is not news. Today, news is scandals. That's news. But the many children who don't have food, that's not news. We cannot rest easy while things are this way, said the Pope. It's time, isn't it? It's time for you and me, for our congregations and communities to begin loving not just the folks who look like us and act like us and say the proper thank you and do what we want them to do, it's time to begin loving. Loving like we won't get hurt. Amen. Amen. And then there's the dancing. Dancing like nobody's watching. But none of us, not one bit of us, we'll find that dancing is something we want to do alone. You see, we don't save ourselves by ourselves, and we weren't, aren't even the initiators of that salvation. We don't grow in faith by ourselves. There have been people, prayers, some community interceding so that we might grow to become more human, more fully Christian, those of you who are being licensed and commissioned and ordained are to go out into the communities of Wisconsin and beyond to work all by yourself and do your own thing? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Listen, church. You won't prosper as individuals, as congregations, and we won't as a denomination if we keep acting as if we don't need anyone else. The whole story in this book is a story of relationship. It's a story of seeking and finding the balance between liberty and restraint, between leading 
and following, between teaching and learning, between giving and receiving. It's a story of being slaves to one another. It's a dance, and it's not done alone. What a story we have. A story of casting aside the boxes that would inhibit our growing and learning and sharing and witnessing. It's a story of freedom. Freedom to sing like we don't need the money. Love like we won't get hurt. <laughs> and dance like nobody's watching. May it be so. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand together as we respond to this word. God in the spirit revealed in Jesus Christ calls us by grace. Today is the day God cares for the integrity of creation, wills the healing and wholeness of all life, weeps at the plunder of earth's goodness. And so shall we. Today is the day God embraces all hues of humanity, delights in diversity and difference, favors solidarity, transforming strangers into friends. And so shall we. Today is the day God cries with the masses of starving people, despises growing disparity between rich and poor, demands justice, for workers in the marketplace. And so shall we. Today is the day God deplores the violence in our homes and streets, rebukes the world's warring madness, humbles the powerful, and lifts up the lowly. And so shall we. Today is the day God calls for nations and peoples to live in peace, celebrates where justice and mercy embrace, exalts when the wolf grazes with the lamb. And so shall we. Today is the day God brings good news to the poor, proclaims release to the captives, gives sight to the blind, and sets the oppressed free. And so shall we. Please be seated. I present these persons for licensing as local pastors. These persons have completed the requirements for the local pastor's license and are recommended by the District Committee on Ordained Ministry. We have inquired diligently concerning them and have found them fit for this sacred vocation. I invite them to come forward as their names are called. Sean Cornell not with us today, Roberta, Roberta Norwicki, Tua Thomas Tao, Elizabeth Whitford, By affirming the covenant of baptism, all members of Christ's holy church pledge to serve as Christ's representative in the world. The church has discerned that these are persons of sound learning and of Christian character, possessing the necessary gifts and signs of God's grace for this ministry. We ask you, people of God, to declare your assent to the licensing of these persons. Do you trust that they are called by God's grace to be licensed? We do so trust. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Will you hope 
uphold them in their ministries. With God's help, we will. You are hereby authorized to serve as a licensed local pastor in the charge and circuit to which you are appointed. Take care of that you perform these duties faithfully, the Lord being your helper. After due examination of your call and ministry, we now welcome you as a licensed local pastors. You have given assurance of your faith and Christian experience. You have committed it to yourself, to the work of a pastor under appointment of the bishop. We send you forth to serve as a licensed local pastor in Wisconsin Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose word is true, in keeping of which is eternal life, we thank you for these persons whom we set apart in your name as licensed local pastors. Prepare them in body, mind, and spirit for their path, path. Continue and continue them, them in your grace that they Amen. may increase and bless your church through your labors, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Congratulations. to welcome these colleagues in our ministry. So you go now. On behalf of the laity of local congregations who have examined and approved these candidates, and on behalf of the Board of Ordained Ministry of this annual conference, which has recommended these persons, and this annual conference which has approved them, we present these, these persons, persons to, to be commissioned for the work of a deacon. Susan C. Ammon. Laura K. Bernard. We present these persons to be commissioned for the work of an elder. Rafael Antonio Cubilete Sanchez. <laughs> Crystal Lee Didi. <laughs> Mao Vang Her. Rosa Maria Mayorga. Rosa 
<laughs> Angela Beth Steinhauer. We present this person to be ordained deacon, Amy Jo Anderson. We present these persons to be ordained elder, Heather Lee Brewer. Maribel Maurice Solis. Stephen P. Scott. Loretta Elizabeth Waffle. And Julie Ann Wilson. These persons are by God's grace to be commissioned or ordained ministry in Christ's holy church. Those authorized by the church to inquire about them have discerned that they are a persons of sound learning and of a Christian character and possess the necessary sign of God's grace and have demonstrated a profound commitment to serve Jesus Christ. Therefore, we believe them to be duly called to serve God. We ask you, people of God, to declare your assent to the commissioning or ordination of these persons. Do you trust that they are worthy by God's grace to be commissioned or ordained? Will you uphold them in their ministry? Ordination is a gift from God to the church and is uh, exercised in the covenant with the whole church and within the covenant of the order of deacons or elders. My sisters and brothers in Christ, you have been called to the commission or ordained ministry. The church has now confirmed your calling. As commissioned or ordained ministers, you are to be co-workers with the, the laity, bishops, deacons, diaconal ministers, deaconesses, home missioners, and commissioned ministers and local pastors and elders. Remember that you are called to serve rather than to be served to proclaim the faith of Christ and no other, to look after the concern of God above all, so that we may now that you believe yourself to be called by God and they that you process, profess the Christian faith, we ask you this general question. Do you believe that God has called you to the life and the work of an ordained ministry. I do, so. do you believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I do, I do so. so believe and confess. Are you persuaded that the scripture of the Old and New Testament contains all things necessary? for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ and are the unique and authoritative standard for the church's faith and life. I am so persuaded by God's grace. Will you be faithful in prayer, in the study of the Holy Scriptures, and with the help of the Holy Spirit continually rekindle the gifts of God that is in you? I will. 
Will you do your best to pattern your life? Mm, pattern your life. Pattern your life in accordance with the teachings of Jesus Christ. I will, with the help of God. Will you, in the exercise of your ministry, lead the people of God to faith in Jesus Christ, to participate in the life and the work of one community, and to seek peace, justice, and freedom for all people? Will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church, accepting its order, liturgy, doctrine, and discipline, defending it against all doctrine contrary to God's holy word, and committing yourself to be accountable with those serving with you, and to the bishop and those who are appointed to supervise your ministry? May God has given you the will to do these things, give you grace to perform them, that the work begins in you may be brought to perfection. Amen. Amen. And this is the people that you examine and welcome. That would you say welcome? The lesson for commissioning comes from Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon the Niger, Lucius from Cyrene, Manion, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. One day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia and then sailed for the island of Cyprus. There, in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. Let us pray together. God of the apostles and prophets, and of the martyrs and teachers, you raise up men and women to be apostolic leaders in your church. By your Holy Spirit, help these, your servants, to understand and live the mystery of your love with boldness and joy. Deepen their sense of purpose as they exercise commission ministry. Empower them and those who will walk with them to guide their ministry together with you, all of your people to heal the sick and love the outcast, resist the evil, preach the word, and give themselves freely for your name's sake. Amen. Amen. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Susan Ehrman. Send her now to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to announce the reign of God, and to equip the church for ministry. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
I know that those who support this candidate, these leaders, you can stand and pray together for them. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Laura Bernard. Send her now to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to announce the reign of God, and to equip the church for ministry in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Rafael Antonio Cugulate Sanchez. Send him now to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to announce the reign of God, and to equip the church for ministry in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Christa Lady. Send her now to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to announce the reign of God, and to equip the church for ministry. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Mao Beng Her. Send her now to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to announce the reign of God, and to equip the church for ministry. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Rosa Maria Mayorga. Send her now to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to announce the reign of God, and to equip the church for ministry. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Angela Beth Steinhauer. Send her now to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to announce the reign of God, and to equip the church for ministry. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Congratulations. Let us pray together. Almighty God, may the grace of ministry rest upon this servant and may the opportunity to serve lead them into the fullness of your calling. Clothe them with your righteousness and grant that they may glorify you by giving themselves to others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you welcome them, these all leaders?
Well, amen. That's going to be a, a hard act to follow. <laughs> Please do remain standing for the reading of the gospel. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. A deacon is called to share in Christ's ministry of servanthood, to relate the life of the community to its service in the world, to lead others into Christian discipleship, to nurture disciples for witness and service, to lead in worship, to teach and proclaim God's word, to assist elder at holy baptism and holy communion, to interpret the church, the world's hurt and hope, to serve all people, particularly poor, the sick, and the oppressed, and to lead Christ's people in ministries of compassion and justice, liberation and reconciliation, even in the face of hardship and personal sacrifice. These are the duties of a deacon. Do you believe that God has called you to life and the work of a deacon? Will you, for the sake of church, life, and mission, covenant to participate in the order of deacons? Will you give yourself to God through the order of deacon in order to sustain and build each other up in prayer, study, worship, and service? I will, with the help of God and with the help of my sisters and brothers in the order of deacons. Let us pray. At this person, as, as this person ordained by God and the, oh, I'm sorry, not a pray. You can. <laughs> I'm following step. <laughs> At this person is ordained by God and church for the ministry of the deacon, to which we believe she has been called by the Holy Spirit. So let us uh, pray for her. We thank you, living God, that in your great love, you sent Jesus Christ to take the form of a servant, becoming obedient even to the death on cross, and now resurrected it and exerted it in heaven. You have taught us by word and example that whoever would be greater, great among us must be a servant of all. Give this servant grace to the faithful to her promise, constant in her discipleship, and always ready for the work of a loving service. Make her modest and humble, gentle and strong, rooted in and grounded in love. Give her a, a share in the ministry of Jesus Christ, who come not to be served, but to serve. We have uh, bishops. Raider and Bishop Cho Lee and Bishop Lee, Linda Lee, and also that among the here, the sponsored and 
and also Ray Barkley, our elder, that from our Native American community, we gathered together to ordain this person. Almighty God, pour upon Amy Joe Anderson the Holy Spirit for the office and the work of a deacon in Christ's holy church. Amen. Amy Joe Anderson, take authority as a deacon to proclaim the word of God and to lead God's people in the ministry of compassion and justice. And in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Congratulations. So now you can greet everyone here, please. <laughs> Invite who is, you may be seated. Invite who going to be ordained as elder to come stand from here because the Heather, we're not going to going up, okay? Just to stay in the floor. Thank 
you. An elder is called to share the ministry of Christ and of the whole church to preach and teach the word of God and faithfully administer the sacrament of a holy baptism and holy communion to lead the people of God in worship and prayer, to lead the persons to faith in Jesus Christ, to exercise a personal supervision, order the life of the congregation, counsel the troubled, and declare the forgiveness of sin, to lead the people of God in obedience to Christ's mission in the world, to seek justice, peace, and freedom for all people and to take a responsible place in the government of the church and in service in and to the community. These are the duties of an elder. Do you believe that God has called you to the life and the work of an elder? I do so believe. Will you, for the sake of the church's life and mission, covenant to participate in the order of elders Will you give yourself to God through the order of elders in order to sustain and build each other up in prayer, study, worship, and service? I will, with the help of God and with the help of my sisters and brothers in the order of elders. As these persons are ordained by God and the church for the ministry of elder to which we believe, if they've been called by the Holy Spirit, let us pray for them. We praise you, eternal God, because you have called us to be a priestly people, offering to you acceptable worship through Jesus Christ, apostle and high priest, shepherd, and the bishop of our souls. We thank you that by dying, Christ has overcome death, and having ascended it into heaven, has poured the false gifts abundantly on your people, making some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to build up Christ's body, and to fulfill your gracious purpose in the world. Give to these your servants the grace and power they need to serve you in this ministry. Make them faithful persons, patient teachers, and wise counselors. Enable them to serve without reproach, to proclaim the gospel of salvation, to administer the sacraments of a new covenant to order the life of the church and to offer with all your people spiritual sacrifice acceptable to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let me go back. You just to stand that way. <laughs> I'm going to come close to you. Almighty God, pour upon Heather Lee Brewer the Holy Spirit for the office and work of an elder in Christ's holy church. Amen. Amen. Heather Leesburg, take the authority as an elder to preach the word of God, to administer the holy sacraments, and to order the life of church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 <laughs> no more trouble. <laughs> So it probably Anne might visit that.
So, well, you're still free. You can walk. Let us give a welcome her on this journey. Well, when they are finished their ordination, I hope that you can hula or whatever, you can dance in some way, huh? Almighty God, pour upon Maribel Mary Salis, the Holy Spirit, for the office and the work of an elder in the Christ of Holy Church. Amen. Amen. Maribel Mary Salis, take the authority as an elder to preach the word of God, to administer the holy sacraments, and to order the life of the church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Congratulations. Almighty God, pour upon Stephen P. Scott, the Holy Spirit, for the office and the work of an elder in Christ's holy church. Amen. Amen. Steve Scott, take authority as an elder to preach the word of God and to administer the holy sacraments and to order the life of church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Brother, Thank you so much. congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so
this is a close couple, so I might probably ask them to hugging or kissing or whatever. <laughs> Actually, I need to do the Mary, the, the, the Mary Bear too. They are close couple too. Why don't you do that now? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Later, we might invite you to front. Almighty God, pour upon Loretta Elizabeth Waffer, the Holy Spirit, for the office and the work of an elder in Christ's Holy Church. Amen. Amen. Loretta Elizabeth Waffer, take authority as an elder to preach the word of God and to administer the holy sacraments and to order the life of the church. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Great. Almighty God, pour upon Julianne Wilson the Holy Spirit for the office and the work of an elder in Christ's holy church. Amen. Amen. Julianne Wilson taken authority as an elder to preach the word of God and to administer the holy sacraments and to order the life of the church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Congratulations. Great job, great job.
Friends, this afternoon's offering is truly a work of compassion and grace. It goes to support the Clergy and Transitions Fund, which is a fund that uh, is used to assist and support clergy and their families who are transitioning out of ministry to pursue other calls and vocations. So let us continue in this glorious celebration with the presentation of our gifts.
Christ our Lord. Christ our Lord, invite to his table all who love him and all who seek to be at peace with God and one another. The peace of the Lord be always be with you. And also with you. God be with you in all love. Lift your heart to God above. It is right and good to give our thanks and praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Because there is one love, we who are many are one body because we all partake of the one love. The bread we which break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. The United Methodist Church practice open communion. All people of Christian faith are welcome at this table. So now, before this whole distribution, I will invite those who are serving into the podium.
together both We thank you, gracious God, for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us and united us in the communion of your Holy Spirit. We bless you for the raising up among us faithful servants. Close them and us with your righteousness and grant that we with them may glorify you by giving ourselves to others. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It is great honor and great celebration today that all the family and friends who've been ordained, and you nurtured through your prayer. I know many times you had a tears in behind. You labored together for this journey. And that's why we are here together as a community of faith. It's my deep privilege, high privilege, and wide privilege that be a servant for this community as a bishop. But I need to really, ending this service, I need to say thank you to Bishop Lee. Linda Lee was just previous bishop, just been here eight years. She is, she's here because she nurtured many of you. It was very gifted for us to have her in presence here. Would you give her hand one more time? <laughs> and I say, sister, we are living in a neighborhood. This is your conference. Don't ever feel you are distant. That's we are. Praise God. Our preacher today, the Bishop Sharon Raider, she's been serving here in this conference 12 years. <laughs> of course, I was one who was called by her as a serving in her cabinet. I know that long, long time be a mentor and friend, but also tremendous the leaders in our denomination and our church. So it was a come here as a preacher today. It is such an honor. Let us welcome back her again in our... <laughs> and Bishop Cho Lee, is our sister conference, Dongbu, and your conference, Korean Methodist Church, that he and delegate, most of them is here in this present, but they traveled it far by celebrating this event and our conference as partner. And we thank you and welcome Bishop Lee again. <laughs> A 
And many thanks to our clergy community here. Look at them. How many are there here? I'm proud of you. I thought you were going to sneak away. <laughs> but you're here. That's the power. That's the power of community. I am convinced that we have a strong future together. Amen. Thank you for choir. Thank you for the, all the family members. I know we have a reception after this, so please join. The grace of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Go in peace to serve God and neighbor in all that you do. In Christ's name, thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.